Greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. We are so excited to be with you this evening. A big welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream or watching the recording of our webinar, The Muslim Vote, Past, Present, and Future. This webinar is educational and nonpartisan. It is Georgia focused, but I'm sure it's applicable to many communities across our country. I am Sumaya Khalifa, Executive Director of the Islamic Speakers Bureau of Atlanta, or ISB. The ISB is a nonprofit organization founded in August of 2001, so we are 21 years old. The ISB builds bridges of understanding and mutual respect with all our neighbors. Our vision is a world where everyone values and appreciates one another. We do that through our programming and initiatives, whether delivering presentations about Islam and Muslims, answering questions, being on panels, developing relationships with elected officials and or uh, just our neighbors, leaders of many different organizations. We also do have a leadership program in collaboration with Kennesaw State University. We elevate the narratives of Georgia Muslims through our recognition programs, Influential Georgia Muslims, 40 Under 40, and 20 Under 20. We also recognize movers and shakers in the community who are making a huge difference, such as Bishop Rob Wright of the Episcopal Diocese of Atlanta, Arthur Blank, owner of the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United, and Sally Yates, former Assistant U.S. Attorney General. The ISB has been called a convener of communities. The ISB partners with other organizations to bring needed programming, such as today's program, where we are partnering with the Georgia Muslim Voter Project. On a personal note, I did not grow up and was not born in a country where voting was prevalent. Everyone just heard on the media that the one candidate running for the office received 99% of the votes, and guess what? He got the job. Moving with my family to Texas as a preteen and hearing about voting in elections for local, county, state, and federal offices was very confusing to me. It wasn't until I took a course on civics in high school with Mr. Barnes that I gained an appreciation and understanding of the process and of how our government should work. Voting is a privilege and also a responsibility that we all must take seriously. Today, our objectives are to encourage voting and civic engagement within the Muslim community, discuss the impact of the American Muslim community in the public square. And so those are our two main objectives. And I am so honored and pleased to introduce our partner from the Georgia Muslim Voter Project, Soraya Sharkair. Soraya is very knowledgeable and passionate about her work and it's been a lovely experience working with her. Soraya. Oh, thank you, Samaya. Um, thank you for the great introduction. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Soraya Sharker, and I'm the organizing director of the Georgia Muslim Voter Project, or GAMVP. We were founded in 2015 in response to the growing anti-Muslim rhetoric that was prevalent in mainstream politics and the low rates of civic engagement in the Muslim community. Our mission is to build power for Georgia's diverse Muslim and immigrant communities through voter registration, voter education, and other active forms of civic engagement. You may have seen us at your local halal spot or masjid registering voters. You may have gotten a call or text from us asking you to go out and vote. Maybe you saw us at your state legislature or at your local city council meeting advocating for voting rights. Our staff at GAMVP believe that through relational organizing, deep canvassing, long-term leadership development, we can truly make change because this is our home, our vote. The American Muslim community is already activating around politics. However, there's more work to be done. There are over 100,000 Muslims in the state of Georgia. The 2020 presidential election was decided in Georgia by a mere 11,779 votes, making the Muslim population ninefold the margin of victory and a key constituency. Over the last four years, the Muslim community has registered, organized, and turned out to vote. Due to this, we have had unprecedented levels of voter turnout. Not only are our community members turning out to vote, Muslim Americans currently hold powerful elected positions in our state uh, from city council to Senate. Uh, to state senate and of course county commission like commissioner khadija abdur rahman who is speaking today additionally we have five muslim candidates running this november 
Our path forward as a community is a future where Muslims hold positions of power in all sectors of government, where being a Muslim politician is normal and not an outlier, where a qualified candidate's Muslim identity is not a barrier for them uh, winning an, an election, where any Muslim child can see themselves and their interests truly represented within our government. The American Muslim poll in 2022 found that that most American Muslims, one fourth of our population are between the ages of 18 to 29. This means young Muslim voters are our future. We believe that in order to cultivate lifelong voters, we need to engage voters in every local state and national election. Through voting civic and civic engagement, we can not only demand our voices be heard, we can also ensure our communities truly hold political power. Now you're gonna have to bear with me for a second because I'm gonna brag a little. This year, GAMVP has organized candidate forums, bus community members from Juma prayer to their early voting locations to vote. We had Muslim community members lobbying at the Capitol, organized over 30 educational trainings, launched our first ever youth ambassador program with 15 young Muslims, registered over 800 voters, and we are contacting over 80,000 Georgia Muslim voters on the phone, over text, via, the, via mail, and at their doors to encourage them to vote. Our work does not end here. Our path forward as a community is a future where Muslims not only vote, but go beyond voting and actively participate in politics by advocating for our community's political priorities. Through legislative advocacy, mutual aid initiatives, and community organizing, where masjids become polling locations, where our aunties and uncles feel comfortable speaking at the Capitol, where our imams and community leaders are being consulted by decision makers. Through community organizing, educational programming, programming, and leadership development within the Muslim community, we will ensure our communities have a seat at the table and our issues are being centered in the political narrative. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Samaya. So Raya, this is so amazing. You got me so excited and just ready to take over the world. Thank you so much. Money Magazine just named Atlanta as the number one place to live in the United States. But y'all know what? We knew that already. They just put it in print and we really appreciate that. We are so very privileged to have Maria, the Maria Supporta, moderate our panel today. Maria is a very well-known and respected journalist in Atlanta. She was with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, CNN, the Atlanta Business Chronicle, and she is currently with the Supporter Report. Maria and I were having lunch a couple of weeks ago to discuss the webinar, and I know that she left me to interview an Atlanta-based CEO about a program they were bringing on to Atlanta. So this is the level of people that Maria engages with. Let me just say that whenever Maria speaks in Atlanta, Atlanta listens. Please help me in welcoming Maria Supporta as our moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumaya. And um, I'm whenever you want to have lunch with me again, I'm, I'm right there with you because uh, it's always delightful. Um, the importance of civic engagement is an issue that I think we, we will be talking and focusing on today. And I find it fascinating, your story, uh, your personal story, Sumaya, of coming to the United States and not realizing the importance of voting because it had been, you know, under dictatorships or um, authoritarian forms of government, that's not an option. It's not a choice. Uh, decisions are made for you. I found it a bit sobering that you said you had a civics class. I'm not so sure how many high schools or middle schools or elementary schools teach civics anymore. And as a result, we as community members need to make sure that our fellow citizens are aware of how to become civically involved, how to become involved in the election process, how to register to vote, all of these things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, civic engagement is what makes our democracy a democracy. And when you have people not voting, not getting involved, we cannot be comfortable with the government that ends up getting into office and representing us. So we are so fortunate today to have an amazing group, amazing panel. And I'm just gonna give very brief introductions of everyone. Um, we have Imam uh, Plumman El Amin. Uh, Plumman, uh, Imam Plumman is the Imam Emeritus of the Atlanta Masjid of 
al-Islam, one of the largest and most progressive mosques in the United States. He also was quite a football player, I think, uh, when he was in high school, scoring a 60-yard touchdown against my alma mater, Grady High School. So um, welcome, uh, Imam Plimon. Um, we ha also have Akil Secret. And uh, Akil uh, Kenneth Secret is an attorney uh, in the state of Georgia and Nebraska. His practice focuses on uh, serious personal injury litigation, wrongful death litigation, and major criminal defense. And he can provide our legal perspectives today. We also have Atlanta City Council President uh, Doug Shipman, uh, who was elected as president of the Atlanta City Council in November 2021. Uh, for those of us who've been around a while, we know Doug Shipman was the founding director, uh, president and CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, a project that he helped bring to fruition. And after that, he went to become the CEO of the Woodruff Arts Center. And then there was that political bug that bit him. So we can uh, learn more about that. And last but certainly not least is Fulton County Commissioner Khadija Abdul-Rahman. And um, Ms. Commissioner um, Khadija, I hope it's okay to refer to you by your first name, continues to make history as a Fulton County Commissioner. Uh, she represents Southwest Atlanta and the Southern part of Fulton County. And she is the first Muslim woman ever elected in the state of Georgia. She's made a big difference in just her first year in office, representing District 6. And um, so, as you can tell, we have an amazing group, and um, we, we will kick it off now. And I will turn first to Imam Plamen and ask him, what does the Muslim tradition teach us about civic involvement? Uh, well, thank you, Maria. I we had mentioned on the warm up about the touchdown against Grady High. Didn't want you to put that out. It's been so long ago, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, what does the Muslim tradition teach us about civic engagement? Really, we are obligated as Muslims. So I'll start with the basic concept behind that upholds Islam is the oneness of God, that there's one creator, sustainer, uh, and, and judge of everything, the whole creation. And so with that idea of the oneness of God, it clearly uh, leads us to understand that uh, everything in creation, everybody, all of humanity is connected in, in, in spite of, and even actually through our great diversity, we all are tied together and connected. So from an Islamic perspective, uh, we, we are obligated to engage those who God has blessed to live on this earth and not only other people, but also the environment that God has placed us in. Uh, it, the Quran, God says, that tells us that all of us are Khalifa, or custodians, or vicegerents in the earth, that we have an obligation to take care and to nurture uh, and develop the earth and each and everybody that lives on this earth. So we're, we're obligated to be in, engaged. Uh, Quran further says that our prophet Muhammad, pass and peace be upon him, uh, is a mercy to all the worlds, a mercy to all of humanity. And so we have to have this broad scope when we talk about uh, the life around us and the, and the world that we live in. Um, the Quran says that... Um, that there arise out of you a community of people inviting to all that is good and enjoying what is right and discouraging what is wrong. They are the ones to attain success and felicity. So from an Islamic perspective, we have to come out. We can't be comfortable just sitting in our homes uh, with our family. We have to get engaged with the outer society and actually compete in goodness competing goodness uh, and, and to encourage uh, and enjoy what is right and discourage what is wrong 
And that's uh, our obligation as Muslims, no matter where we may live. Uh, God says to each is a goal, to each person and to each people is a goal to which he turns you. So strive together as if in a race towards all that is good and wheresoever you are, through that effort, God brings us together. So uh, the basic principle of civic engagement is tied up into these responsibilities that we hold as human beings, uh, and not just to other Muslims, but to any other human being. The process that we use is, that gets into the politics of things uh, is based on the concept of shura. God says that, that there be mutual cult consultation, that we are to have find a consensus among ourselves. We are to talk with others and people who differ from us. We are to sit down at a table and have conversations. Uh, the Quran says, argue with them in ways that are best. Uh, so we, we know that there will be disagreements and misunderstandings, but to always do it in the best way and to have this sharing of uh, ideas and to come to some type of consensus. And then we also have the concept of uh, beya. Beya means allegiance. And so really this is translated into Muslim society, into general society as the Muslim's obligation to vote, to make a decision, to say, I support this person. I support this idea. I support this cause. And, and I give my allegiance to that cause. And so we, are, we have all of these things that are, are foundational principles in our religion that we are obligated to uh, uh, bring to life and to live upon. Now, uh, the history of our engagement in America is interesting because uh, it, it, from 1924 to probably 1954, somewhere in there, uh, not many Muslims were allowed to immigrate into America. There was a restriction on Islamic uh, Muslim countries immigrating into America. Most immigration were coming from uh, Europe and, and actually from the uh, Western parts of Europe. So Islam actually came to these shores with the African slave. And so during these the early uh, 1900s, we developed uh, independent Muslim movements in the African-American community. And, and, and we were influenced as well by the freedom movement, uh, the civil rights movement led by Dr. King. Dr. King brought, uh, uh, expanded the idea or actually put doors and gates in the idea of separation of church and state. Uh, before Dr. King and the civil rights movement, it, you didn't have much exchange in terms of politics and religion. But uh, in the civil rights movement, he brought that out. And uh, Dr. King said, on one hand, uh, religious leaders must work to, to uh, change the souls of individuals so societies will change for the better. But on the other hand, religious leaders must work to change society so individual souls will have a chance. And so that resonated with the African-American Muslims as well. And you could uh, if you go back and study what Malcolm was saying, the, the ballot or the bullet, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, propagating uh, violence per, per se, but he was bringing it up that if people don't get a, a voice or people aren't uh, allowed to vote, then what other choices do they have? When uh, his leader, Elijah Muhammad, passed and, and the Nation of Islam's leader passed, Elijah Muhammad, his son, Elijah Muhammad's son, Wartha Dean Muhammad became the leader. And he began to really espouse this idea of our obligation as American Muslims to vote, to register to vote, uh, and to be engaged in uh, the civic uh, arena. Uh, and he actually did something that hadn't been done before this time. And it's like, we're talking about 1976. He actually put an American flag in the mosque. And so this, this, this hadn't been done before. Now, if you go back and look at um, Jewish faith, you see that the Jewish faith understood that concept early on, and you would see American flag or American eagle in the synagogue, but in a mosque and not too often in a church even, would you see the American flag. So he raised that to, to bring to our attention that you have to be at home somewhere before you can be at home everywhere. 
because Islam is a global religion. Sometimes we can look at any place in the world and, and see our identity, but we have to say some place is home and we needed that idea to, to uh, see ourselves as Muslim Americans and to get engaged in the civic uh, life here in America. Uh, and then soon after that, I mean, he was criticized, Warthani Muhammad, Wallace Muhammad, he was criticized for that. Uh, but, but he also, uh, soon after, immigrant Muslims began to recognize the wisdom in that, and they began to also identify not so much from the land in which they came from. They, they didn't throw that identity away, but they began to look at the, the land where their children were born as being home and that we have to participate in the civic affairs of where we live. So I'll say a couple other things. Muslims, uh, Imam Muhammad said, Muslims have nothing to offer contemporary civilization if we keep ourselves isolated from it. So we all feel like we have so much to give, but because of isolation of ideas of, of not registering, not voting, not getting engaged, we are denying the rest of our uh, community, what gifts we do have. But also when you exchange with other people, when you get involved, uh, as Dr. King would say, involvement is inspiration. When you, when you get involved, you become inspired and you begin to see your own reality in a different way. So um, it's fundamental to be civically involved as a Muslim and to, see the, the, the beauty and the wisdom uh, in the exchange with people that are different from us so that we can all work together to make our community, our city, our state, our nation, and eventually our world a better place as God would have it. So let me stop there, Maria. Thank you. And thank you so much for uh, being here and hosting us. Well, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and your wisdom and your perspective. And uh, before I ask uh, Doug Shipman uh, the next question, I wanted to make sure, welcome first our live stream audience. Uh, thank you for coming. And we want you to know that uh, we want you to ask questions. If something uh, strikes you and you want to know more, we welcome you to put your comments or questions uh, in the comment section of Facebook Live. And then uh, after we finish our conversation, our formal conversation, we will start taking questions uh, from you, uh, but you have to leave them in Facebook Live. So thank you for doing that. Um, I know that uh, Imam Plumman kind of got into an area that I wanted you to um, respond to, Doug. Uh, President Doug, I guess I should uh, should be formal. Um, the history of voting and discrimination of certain groups in the United States shows that this was not something we were, you know, that the when the United States was founded, that everyone had the right to vote, and it became especially true in the South. And given your your studies and your work experiences. Can you uh, shed light on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Let me just begin by saying wa alaikum assalam to um, both the Georgia uh, Muslim Voter Project and as well as ISB. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you're right, Maria, that from the very founding of the country, questions of voting and citizenship were very restricted uh, to land holding white males in the Constitution. Of course, we had the three-fifths compromise, which meant that uh, enslaved people were only counted as three-fifths of a person, but were counted for population uh, uh, only, but not allowed, obviously, to vote, nor to have freedom. Those restrictions were changed slowly over time, and I think it's worth noting that, that they not only applied to enslaved people, but as immigrants came from Asia, uh, they were uh, deemed to be not uh, white and therefore not citizens. And the same happened with those coming from uh, South Asia, from those coming from the African continent. And so all of those restrictions had to be uh, basically changed over time as well as women, obviously. I think what's interesting is that in Georgia specifically, 
Uh, Georgia, as well as many other Southern states, restricted uh, African-Americans from voting uh, until 1946, which was much earlier than a lot of other states, because a gentleman named Primus King decided that he was going to challenge the Democratic primary, because the important thing was not the general election, it was the Democratic primary, because at that time, only Democrats were winning, Republicans weren't winning in state elections. Primus King actually won that case. Thurgood Marshall, the, the very famous uh, lawyer who would then become a justice on the Supreme Court, actually argued the appeal of that case in federal court for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And it led to African-Americans being able to vote in the Democratic primary in the 1940s, well ahead of other Southern states who would not find their way to African-Americans voting in any elections really until the 50s and really until the 60s. So what is that, why did that, why was that important? Because then it opened up on a city level of Atlanta, a coalition between African-American voters and white voters that could elect the mayor. And therefore the mayor of Atlanta could build a coalition that at the time was relatively progressive. We saw that uh, with Mayor Hartsfield at the time who became more progressive after the Primus King decision. We saw that with Mayor Ivan Allen who was the only Southern politician to actually testify for civil rights uh, legislation to be passed at the federal level. And Mayor Ivan Allen could literally drive Martin Luther King Jr. home to in the mayoral car to Dr. King's home. No other Southern politician could do that politically. They would have been thrown out of office. But because of that interesting coalition and that political power that African-Americans had been able to garner, you saw that sort of unique political situation. And then of course you started to see African-American politicians being able to win state rep seats, state Senate seats, and broader political power. The other thing that, that Pleeman Alameen touched on that I think is really important is that the uh, uh, 1965 Civil Rights Legislation, the Voting Rights Act was passed in April, May of that year. In September of the same year, September 1965, President Johnson went to Ellis Island underneath the Statue of Liberty and he signs immigration reform, which actually opens up immigration to be widespread for Asian countries and for African countries, basically for non-European countries. And this leads to a the real wave, the opening up of immigrant communities that we see continue today from all of those various places, really started in 1965. And it's no accident because the same coalition that had been pushing civil rights also was pushing for immigration reform, because they said this is not fair that we are only basically allowing white countries to form uh, the basis of our immigration. So then you basically start to have new immigrants come, which then begins to build political power, political participation as they come, as they become citizens in the 70s, in the 80s and beyond. And so all of this is to say that I think this history shows that one, it takes a lot of work. Two, it has real consequences because if you can get vote and you can get participation, you actually can gain political power. And the other thing that, that uh, Imam Alameen touched on that I want to reinforce is the notion, especially in the South, of interreligious coalitions having political power. Dr. King uh, and many members of the civil rights movement were ministers. There were deep coalitions with the Jewish community. There were deep coalitions with um, Dr. King nominated Thich Nhat Hanh, a Buddhist monk for the Nobel Peace Prize. There were deep uh, connections with Buddhist communities who marched. And there were deep connections with Muslim communities and Muslim leaders who marched during the civil rights movement too. And I think we've continued to see that in a place like Georgia, as we've seen folks like Commissioner Rahman who have come into public uh, office with their religion, with their Muslim religion, but lots of people are coming in the public space in Georgia with religion, right? And so that actually can become a coalition builder on all sides of the political spectrum. It's not owned by one side or the other. And so I think that's also very interesting. And I think that that's a path forward because religion in the public, square, uh, in the public square can shape the way that we think about policy. And so I don't think in a place like Georgia, you have to leave the religion at the door. I think you actually can bring it in and it can become the formulation of questions of ethics. It can uh, form the uh, formulation of things like fairness. What does fairness mean? What does serving the community mean? 
And so I think this history is, is one that the nation has gone through, but I think there are some very interesting and unique things about a place like Georgia that show why I think we should have some hope as we continue to try to make sure the political process works for all communities. Thank you, Doug. That's great. Um, wonderful history lesson. I've learned uh, a lot from you over the years and just now. Um, and now I'd like to remind the audience again, you can uh, submit your questions on Facebook Live and we look forward to hearing from you. My next question is uh, to Akil, an attorney who, who will share with us what are some of the legal barriers to civic engagement? How do we overcome them? And can you talk about current laws and, and kind of what we're facing um, here in the fall of 2022 when we have some very important elections um, before us? I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Akil. Let's start over. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And assalamu alaikum to all of those uh, people who are listening to the webinar, to all of the participants, to my longtime friend, Iman Pleeman, uh, to Sister Khadija, Commissioner Khadija, uh, Sister Samaya, uh, Doug, uh, and Sarka. Did I get that right? Sure. All right. No, something like that. All right. Thank you. Uh, and let me, I, I wanted to mention some other historical things, and I hope I'm not redundant with respect to what um, Doug was talking about, but with respect to the right to vote, as he suggested, you know, origin, the Constitution of the United States actually does not mention the right to vote explicitly. It, it, it implies that in some of its texts when it talks about the representatives of the states and the representatives of the Congress, but it, there is no explicit right to vote. And so the struggle to vote in the United States of America is a struggle that is centuries old. Uh, initially, as has been mentioned by uh, Doug, the only persons who could vote in the United States were white men of property. Um, and uh, women were excluded, blacks were excluded, Native Americans were excluded. It was a very uh, privileged uh, club. Uh, and that remained that way. The other thing that's interesting, I think about this history to expand or just hence history to um, uh, expand the right to vote is that the role that African-American voters have played or potential voters have played in this process for the last 100 years. It was actually after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865 that when the right, whether or not black people would have a right to vote became a question is when the, the this whole issue of who has the right to vote began to be voiced. So it, it's, it's important to note that African-Americans in the United States have been in the forefront of this right to expand voting privileges and voting rights for more than a hundred years. Most of us think of that fight mainly in the 50s and the 60s, but that fight actually began back in, in the 1800s. And in fact, it was the 15th Amendment that was passed in 1870 that gave black men, it did not give black women the right to vote, but it gave black men the right to vote at that time. And that was in 1870. It was, and, and that, and it was at that time then that certain Southern states began to not only Southern states, but many states begin to um, uh, enact uh, roadblocks, things like poll tax, things like literary test, thing, literary test, things like um, 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 your educational background. Um, and it was the 19th Amendment, that was the, the amendment in 1919 that allowed then women to vote. And then it was the 26th Amendment that, or excuse me, the 24th Amendment in 1962 that finally eliminated poll tax. But despite the fact that the 15th Amendment was passed, um, it took the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to put some power in the hands of the government to begin to enforce uh, and to ensure that um, Black folks had the right to vote. But even after the passage of the 15th Amendment, states used all kinds of tactics, including violence, the death, to prevent black people from voting. There were poll tax, which most black people obviously could not afford who were mired in poverty. There was a systematic exclusion of black voters. There were literary, literary tests that were used to exclude black voters such, such as some of the ridiculous questions that were on these literary tests were, 
how many bubbles are there in a bar of soap? Uh, these tests were administered uh, at the whim of local election officials, which of course would ultimately mean that only Blacks were required to take these tests. In some instances, Blacks were not allowed to take these tests, which of course meant that they couldn't vote. And then there was, of course, the terror that was associated with preventing Black people from, from voting. The Ku Klux Klan, lynchings, putting fear in the hearts of Black folks to prevent them from voting. The bombing of the church in Birmingham, Alabama, and this is all after the 15th Amendment. And this is all, of course, preceding the 1965 Civil Rights Act. It was in the late 50s and 60s that the Civil Rights Movement faced these forces head on in the battle for voting rights. And I use that word battle literally. People shed blood, they were beaten, they were jailed, killed to secure the right to vote. So I believe that we as Muslims may, must play tribute to those African-American Muslims and otherwise who sacrificed by adamantly exercising their right to vote that they fought for and achieve. Um, so there's one thing to have a, to be entitled to vote. And there's another thing to be eligible to vote. To be entitled to vote means of course that you're 18 years of old, you um, are a citizen of the United States, you are not excluded by any law of disenfranchisement, which basically comes down to whether or not you are living or you currently have a pending felony sentence or if you are mentally incompetent. Uh, other than that, if you're 18 years old, you live in the United States and you're a citizen, you are legally entitled to vote. To be eligible to vote requires some action on your part. It requires you to step up and become registered to vote. It requires you to become registered to vote in the county where you live, in the, in the county where you live, and in the state where you live. Voter registration in Georgia is, is not complicated, but it is not open and shut either. You, you, have, you can register to vote online. You can register to vote by mail. You can register to vote by some of the pop-up shops that are uh, advocated and used by others. Um, you can register to vote at the Secretary of State's office. One of the things to keep in mind if when you register to vote is, is the identification that is required. The, the form of suppression of the vote now has changed from the terror, has changed from the explicit exclusion of certain categories of people to vote to the more sophisticated ways, such as requiring you to have identification, such as, um, and, and, and that identification, you have to have a valid state or federal driver's license. There is a, a such thing or a student identification a valid employee identification, a valid United States passport, a valid United States military photo, or a tribal photo or identification. In the absence of those, there are instances where you can use other forms of identification, including uh, utility bills, light bills, paychecks, bank statements, government checks, and other government documents. So one of the things, of course, if you go to register to vote or you go to vote is to be prepared, uh, to prepare yourself one, in terms of voting by registering to vote, uh, and two, by voting and going to vote to make sure that you have the proper identification, make sure that you are aware and know the precinct that you are to vote at. Uh, you, you can't just vote anywhere. You have to vote at a precinct that, that you live in. You can find your voter precinct by either calling your county, calling the, the Secretary of State's office, calling your county commissioner. Uh, there are ways to determine that. So if there are any other questions, I'll be glad to see if I can address them. Well, I do have one question for you. Um, you can still register to vote uh, in order to vote at the November election, but those days are ticking by us. Um, can you or anyone else on the call tell us by what day we have to register to vote if we are not registered? I think the date is actually October 10th, but since that falls on a Sunday, oh, that's a holiday, it's actually October 11th. You have to be registered to vote by October 11th of 2022. Okay, so that is um, definitely something if you are interested in voting, and I hope everyone on this call is interested in voting, that please be sure you are registered and register by um, 
October 11th, uh, is if I heard you correctly. And I also, uh, there's a lot of concern that maybe some voters have been purged. And you can go to um, the www.mvpmyvoterpage.sos.georgia.gov. Um, uh, and that's again at the Secretary of State's office. And you can check to see if you are uh, continue to be registered, where your precinct is. All oh, those are some of the mechanics. Um, and I know that uh, Soraya will fill us in with uh, some information later on in the call. So, but again, thank you very much, Akil, for walking us through that. And again, last but not least, our commissioner, Kadisha. Uh, can you please um, share with us your personal experiences of uh, running for office and what you felt and what you experienced? And as an elected official, how do you see uh, the Muslim community's impact um, and the influence in the public square? So um, please, please tell us more about you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm so honored, first of all, to be here with such a, a illustrious group of individuals that I have worked with uh, on my journey to getting elected. I have supported and I know of, of your role in not only advocacy of getting the information out, but from a journalistic point of view, you have been very well respected here. And so I am, I am just so humbled to be on this panel with people that I highly respect and admire. As the first woman um, Muslim elected to office in the state of Georgia, um, my, my uh, road or my walk has not been so as much as easy as it has been uh, a, a very satisfying and, and very surreal. Um, when I listen to Imam Pleman and, and to, to Pre President Doug Shipman and even uh, Attorney Sadiq, uh, my, my role and my footsteps are entwined in all of that. And what I mean by that is that my mother, the late Victoria Travis Jackson, was a community activist um, that worked very hard in the community. Uh, she was part of the civil rights community that got Maynard Jackson elected when the leadership turned uh, you know, from one color to another and at sometimes was contentious, but was in other ways, very um, uh, bridging the gap, so to speak. Uh, the home that I live in is in that Southwest Atlanta community where had the, the Berlin Wall, it's called the Peyton Wall, but if you, if you Google it, it says, you know, the, the, it, it gives references to the Berlin Wall. My family was one of the first families that moved in. And so, uh, um, and I'm sorry, uh, attorney, <laughs> secret, Sadiq, I always get y'all mixed up. I'm sorry, brother Kia, <laughs> but thank you. Charge it to my head and not my heart. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, <laughs> um, my, my, my roots have been in activism for civil rights, for equality, for fairness. Since I came out of the womb, I, I grew up in it. Uh, what, what was, uh, I would say, not only amazing, but blessing for me was when I converted to Islam at the age of 27 years old. Now, mind you, I'm 58 now. But I came into a community that believed in voting, but also had to learn among themselves what role as the Islamic community that we needed to have to make sure that we understood what role we have uh, in, in, in voting. Um, I think about what uh, uh, Georgia Voters, uh, Muslim Voters Project does, and I'm so proud of them because I think about, you, you're talking about someone who first ran for office when she was uh, 28 years old. Wow. And I had, I had converted to Islam and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you some of the rooms I sat in, I was told a Muslim woman should not be running for office. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the beauty of that is I don't sit in those rooms anymore because everybody is now encouraging me. Everybody, uh, you know, I, I can go either in Alpharetta or sometimes I can go in Southwest Atlanta or sometimes I can go in West End and I hear individuals say, uh, Commissioner Khadija, I want to run for office. And so it has been a process of not only educating ourselves, but educating the greater community. We always had activism in us. It's just that we may not have realized as the Islamic community, how it's important to us to walk into these spaces with our identity. And the reason I say that, I've been into spaces where I have worked with people. I've been on the um, uh, actual, uh, at Latin League of Aid, I've sat on the executive board for almost 20 years now. And I have friends that maybe about five or six years ago told me, uh, Commissioner uh, Khadija, I did not know you were Muslim. And I told them the greater question was, you did not know that I wasn't. And so once we began to have those conversations and look at the similarities and not the differences, then it is incumbent on the Islamic community to become more proactive and to become part of the process. I am so proud to see us advocating for voter rights. I am so proud to see us uh, engaged in uh, campaigns. I'm so proud in seeing us making sure that all communities, uh, because when we talk about the Islamic community, that is a global community. And all of us deserve a seat at the table and we are being proactive now as Muslims to make sure we have that seat at the table. But what I want to drive home now to the people that are listening, the things that we want don't differ, it doesn't. We want safe communities. We want uh, the best education for our children. We want opportunities to be able to be part of what we call the American dream of prosperity, home ownership. We want to be able to be here and give to the community. As a Muslim, I am charged with being the best example. I am no better than anybody else. But my goal is to be the best example I can to humanity in my role as an elected official who happens to be Muslim. And so my role is to educate not only the Islamic community that we need to participate, but the greater community is that your neighbors, you may not know that they are Muslim, but your neighbors are part of that process that happen to be Muslim. And if we sit down and have these conversations and organize and come together, like uh, President Shipman said, he said, we walk into it with our religion. Every community does that, not just the Islamic community. Sometimes when we do it, it, it seems very big and it only seems that way because there is this notion that Muslims don't get involved in politics. Well, Muslims believe that everything is, comes from God. So every act that we do, everything, no matter if it is the treatment of a, our pet, the treatment of our neighbor, the treatment of our police officers, the treatment of our workers in the community, All of that is an act of worship. All of that is part of what we are charged with being the best in the treatment, being best, putting our best foot forward. And so the Islamic community becoming involved, me being Muslim, I have worked and passed a lot of very progressive legislation with people who look nothing like me, who did not subscribe to quote unquote, the same school of thought, but we came together on items of importance, topics of importance, and what we saw as an agreement for the betterment of community. And so what I charge to 
our friends of uh, in the Islamic community, you're already doing the work. You're already being the best son, daughter, husband, father, neighbor, employee. You're already trying to be the best example of what you can be. Now it's time for us to tra transcend and take that energy inside of the political process for the betterment of not just the Islamic community, but the entire community. Because the more we get involved, the more we sit at the tables, the more that we share what I call common goals and ideals, the best of the best will always uh, make the community better. And we have such gifts to offer in that we want everybody, not just the Islamic community to succeed and be treated fairly. We want everybody to have a sense of fairness. We want everybody to be treated fairly. And so it's very important and uh, timely that the Islamic community uh, becomes more entrenched in the political process and they advocate more for individuals to have a seat at the table who are not only Muslims, but who are all what I call children of God. Because at the end of the day, I cannot sit at my table and eat well knowing that my neighbor goes hungry. I cannot be housed and clothed and warm in, in, in the basket of warmness knowing that there's a homeless person maybe even right outside my door. And so it is with that thought and it is with that desire to make the community whole that the Muslim community becomes stronger, that we work with individuals that may not necessarily look like us, but it is incumbent on them, on us to show them and educate them that there's really not a difference. And any differences are, are much less than we would imagine. It is our similarities that we find strength. And it is the things that we want for the better of society that make not only the community whole, but also allows the Islamic community to become part of the process and not sit on the sidelines. Thank you so much, Commissioner, um, for sharing your personal story and also your views of what it is like to be an elected um, member of Fulton County's board and to be Muslim. And, uh, you know, the two are definitely uh, per those perspectives merge in you. Um, I'm going to ask a question here. Uh, the, the last, oh, God, six six years have been fairly tumultuous and um, especially uh, I know several Muslim friends of mine felt singled out and felt they would not be welcome here. How do you convince Muslims who are scared to put their hand up and say, oh yes, I want to vote. I want to get involved. How? And and this is a conversational thing. And I'm going to throw this out um, to anyone who wants to tackle it. Um, how can one uh, make people feel comfortable getting involved and saying actually uh, that that's part of their their duty as a Muslim or um, as an American citizen or any of the above? Who, who wants to take that on? Well, if you don't mind, I, I would just like to say momentarily, um, I understand that. Um, when when 9-11 happened, uh, you know, my daughter happened to be in school and someone made a, you know, a comment to her that made her very uncomfortable. And so, you know, this, this is real, this feeling of Islamophobia and this feeling of being ostracized and the fear to, to have those conversations is very real. I've, I've, I've encountered them myself. However, this is what I would say. It is incumbent on us to the more pushback we get, to get more involved. You may be, you know, a little fearful or a little hesitant, 
but I promise you there is a voice or there's a person out there that wants to hear you you speak. They they want to learn. I've had so many people say to me, you know, uh, uh, C- Commissioner Khadija, you know, I'm so glad that I voted for you because you helped educate me about, you know, Islam. And, and that to me in itself is the trophy because you imagine someone having a choice to vote for a Muslim as opposed to not voting for a Muslim. What if they never had that choice to vote for me? Do you understand? What if I never ever stepped out on faith and said I needed to run for office? I gave that person a choice and that person was glad because they learned from me. And so I would say to those, and I, and, and that is a real fear. It is, but I'm gonna tell you something else that's a real fear, Maria. It's a real fear for to be a woman and, and be progressive and voices do not want to hear from me as a woman that happens to be progressive. And there's a real fear for me in being African-American and voices that don't want to hear from an African-American. And so sometimes we have to tackle those fears, but in the long run, it is, it is our tenacity to tackle those fears that help others come and bring that view to the table. So I would encourage everybody to just to take that first step because you would never know what will happen and what will be the better of you just taking, you know, that leap of coming out. But that fear is very real. And Imam Plamen, can you talk if if, uh, someone comes to you and says, I'm scared to get involved in the process, how would you guide them? Well, well, just as uh, Commissioner Khadija said, she she took us back to 9-11, which is really the point, um, the 10 years, the decade after 9-11, uh gave muslims the ability to survive just about anything in america so the past six years though they have been difficult but it's nothing like it was after 9 11 that uh 19 people can bring um uh, uh a despicable image on almost two billion people cr- across the world and so as Americans, we, American Muslims, we really, really suffered during those times. But it, it allowed us to, to have a more realistic view of uh, our, our democracy is, we're still infants in democracy here in America. And these last six years have, have shown that even more clearly. Uh, and so that, tells us we have much more to offer and to give to America. You know, we, we're like a, a fresh new energy in the landscape of American life and culture. And, uh, and we have something to offer and something to give. And I think um, surviving uh, the, the repercussions of, uh, and the collateral damage of 9-11 has, in, uh, given Muslims the responsibility and the opportunity to to invest, we are deeply invested in where this country goes. And so, uh, the past six years have been a test for some, but not the kind of test that we have survived. And I believe we have passed the test. You know, I, I have to add to it that all Muslims throughout the world knew this, though Saddam Hussein was not a favorite in the Islamic world by any stretch of means, but all Muslims in the Islamic world knew that Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with each other other than hated one another. And so that whole uh, war that we staged and brought the downfall of that particular country and everything else uh, allows us to see the weaknesses, allows Muslims in general African-Americans, because of our struggles, African-American Muslims, we knew of the weaknesses and the uh, disease of white supremacy. We, we, we always know that that's there. It hadn't been cured yet. But um, Muslims from other parts of the world had not seen that. And, and, and the 9-11 and the, and the collateral damage associated with it brought that to light. But still, we choose to be here 
because we know that the 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 aspirations of America are are the grand aspirations that we believe that that God has lifted up uh, in this in this world in this particular place and and called us here. You know, most immigrants will tell you they came to America because of freedom, democracy, prosperity, education, opportunity, uh, diversity, uh, and, and all of those good things. And they only saw the good until they really felt uh, the oppression uh, in the collateral responses from 9-11. And then now we have, we've gone through this period of where white supremacy has, has uh, taken off uh, their masks and their hoods. And, and uh, we feel that we have a cure for that. And, and that we see ourselves as having uh, uh, an, an obligation to offer that cure along with other right thinking people. And the so, other word yeah. that comes to mind to me oh, yeah. when I think about in response to that question is courage. Um, when I think about what African-American voters went through in the 40s, 50s, and 60s to acquire the right to vote. Um, when you think about uh, John Lewis being beat up across the head at the, at the, at the, on the Pettus Bridge, when you think about the dogs being, being called on the folks in Birmingham, when you think about the, the little girls being bombed in, in Birmingham, what it took to overcome that fear, now that, that, that fear was courage, was, was to be committed to your convictions, that you have a conviction that I want to participate in the civil process and have something to do, to, to contribute and uh, about what my life will be like in this country, um, and I'm going to endure that. And but what those folks endured is is just um, so much more, you know. So certainly we can endure with courage. We can endure um, just being disliked we can do, do no, uh, endure you know side looks we can endure things like that in the push to do something good for our community soraya you wanted to weigh in um yep thank you all for sharing um your thoughts i think those are really amazing answers um i think as someone working on the ground um you know talking to voters on a regular basis um i, I noticed like two things that i would say like really matter when it comes to Muslims voting. The first is representation. Um, so representation in the sense that I think it needs to become a habit within the community for us to go and vote, right? We need to have our community leaders, imams, community members talking about voting um, to a larger scale because our community really respects those individuals. Um, and once it becomes more normalized, um, I think people are more likely to go and actively participate. Um, additionally, I think if we are able to have like more Muslim poll workers or poll monitors Senators, you know, um, more Muslims represented in elected office, um, that I think will make people feel more comfortable voting. And then the second thing is accessibility. Um, I think the uh, the fear sometimes is also just um, this embarrassment a little bit as well. This idea that like I, me casting my ballot or me going to vote, this is a task where, you know, I may feel embarrassed. I may look uneducated because, you know, when I go to the polling location, I'm not taken as seriously, or if I have questions, people aren't answering my questions, or no one's really come to my door and asked me to vote. So it's really important that organizations like um, Georgia Muslim Voter Project, ISB, as well as our community leaders and community members are going and door knocking and talking to people in their language, like telling them about the importance of voting, offering in-language resources, offering rides to the polls, offering other like, you know, childcare and other uh, addressing other accessibility barriers. I think that will help us kind of address this, you know, like people not wanting to vote. Thank you, Soraya. And I was going to ask Doug this. I mean, we've been talking at it from a Muslim point of view, but um, isn't one of the big problems in the American society is, and I don't want to use the word ignorant, um, ignorance, but people are somewhat illiterate in understanding um, the Muslim culture, the differences between uh, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, 
or any other names that we have heard um, in certain ways, how can we work towards um, helping remove the prejudices that exist? And uh, thank God for Samaya starting ISB, uh, what, three weeks before 9-11? Um, imagine where we would be if the, if the Islamic Speakers Bureau had not been established to help really start that conversation. But obviously we are still a long way from actually having people really understand the values of all our um, of all our constituencies and and uh, and different groups that are out there. Yeah, I think as a elected official, it's incumbent on, on anybody who's in public office to use that social media platform, that public platform to showcase holidays, traditions, uh, communities. I've been very heartened over the last few years to see various um, uh, events, dinners uh, hosted at City Hall or public officials going out into the community um, for for Eid, for iftar dinners, uh, specifically in the in the Muslim communities, um, and so I think that's one is to try to embrace specifically the Muslim community, but also the Muslim community as part of a broader embrace of, of religious communities in general. And so I think that's one. I think two is engaging uh, with organizations like the ISB, uh, which I've had the pleasure of working with for a long time in various um, uh, ways. And I think those kinds of organizations are fundamentally educational organizations that are reaching out and are showcasing uh, value systems, uh, are showcasing people. I mean, Commissioner Khadija's point is right. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that they know someone who is Muslim, right? And so there is, there is that uh, accessibility of having personal relationships and I think ISB Atlanta has done that by going into to, uh, other religious congregations, going into businesses with individuals to say, you know, here's my story. And then that brings it from a theoretical standpoint or a television standpoint down to a personal standpoint. Um, and so and then I think the other is I think we've seen over time a growth of uh, nonpartisan advocacy organizations like Georgia MVP. We've seen um, broader AAPI organizations. We've seen broader um, uh, business or business coalitions. Right, there are now a number of business coalitions that are related to um, ethnic or religious groups. And I think those kinds of organizations are another way in which we can build affiliation because someone can say, "Oh, I'm coming into this as a small business owner, and I happen to be Muslim. I'm coming into this as a, a, a transit advocate, <laughs> and, I, and I happen to, you know, hold this faith." And so I think it's I think it's both and I mean one of the interesting things that I that I think we know we're succeeding when somebody can say I am this and 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 that we and that society is not in a place that we're all fighting against society defining each other as only one thing as only skin color as only uh, religion as only sexuality as only ethnicity I think it's an and 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 I would just end by saying, I think that's another way that individuals who are scared about potentially participating can think about it. It may feel like, oh, if I get into uh, you know political space, I may be defined as X, but you can come into the political space through an issue, through um, geography. I'm, you know, I'm, an, I'm an advocate for my neighborhood. I'm an advocate for my city. You can come at it through a business association and also bring all your other identities forward too. And so I think I think part of it is finding the avenue by which we can both educate and the avenue by which people can participate. So one of the questions on Facebook Live, and thank you for submitting it, is how do we combat and address voter apathy within our own networks and communities? So that's almost the other side of the coin is uh, people who don't care enough or or apathetic in terms of getting involved in the political process. Who would like to take that one on? Let, let me just give a quick answer. My quick answer to that is not the only answer, but my quick answer. That's, that's one big advantage to the uh, past years that we've, the extremes that we're seeing, that it's obvious that it makes a difference who you vote for, who, who gets it off. It's just obvious because we're at such extremes. Uh, it, it used to be a time where 
everybody was sort of in the middle and you couldn't, it was hard to distinguish uh, the, the personalities or the abilities, but now we're at extreme. So no one can say it doesn't matter. It does make a difference. It definitely makes a difference. Anyone else want to weigh in on the apathy question? Yeah, I, would, I would just sorry, oh, yeah, just to build just to build on that very quickly. Um, I think we've also seen the flow of money because of COVID, because of of uh, other federal and state uh, laws that have been made. Where money flows has real consequences. I mean, literally, people have gotten checks, families have gotten checks for their children. Hospitals are open, hospitals are closed. I mean, these, these are real effects. I mean, I think voters vote because they see something in it for themselves, right? They see that their own personal life is gonna be impacted. And to, and to uh, Imam Alamin's point, right? We have seen real impacts. And I think we've even seen them on very small levels. We've seen at the city level, we've seen big arguments about zoning. We've seen big arguments about um, trash collection. We've, you know, we've, we've seen that sort of very tangible stuff. And I think the more that we can boil politics down to, here are the ways that you as an individual in this community are gonna be impacted. Here's the way money's gonna change. Here's the way that policy is gonna impact you. I think that increases the engagement with politics. Commissioner, did I understand you wanted to weigh in? On yes, the I, 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 I agree with a uh, president Chipman and also email employment. But just to add to that, give people a choice. Uh, so many individuals, so many of my constituents felt like I was a choice. And so we combat voter apathy when people feel like it's not going to make a difference. I don't have a choice. If I go with A or B, it's not going to impact my life. Yes, it will. But I'm a firm believer, uh, maybe even a dreamer, so to speak, that you give people more choices. You give people opportunity or should I say the Islamic community, take the opportunity, um, uh, put those fears to the side, become active in your school PTA, become active in your neighborhood planning unit or your uh, uh, a local homeowners association, or just, just do a, a community cleanup with your neighbor. I mean, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts and on this journey that I personally can attest to that give people a choice and that helps voter apathy. Get out there and be an example of the change that you want to see. And I promise you, slowly but surely, you begin to get people excited. I think when you had so many extremes and people felt like it didn't make a difference, I do believe that that that, that, that made people sour, so to speak, to politics or the political process. But when we become active, when we become advocates, when we show people there's not a big difference and our similarities far outweigh any of our differences, then people will honestly feel like they do have a choice. I honestly, truly believe on this journey to make a better society and for the Islamic community to get more involved, we have to be an example of the change that we want to see. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And just, and just Maria, just to add to what uh, Commissioner Khadija and uh, Doug have said, I worry more about the apathy after the election because when even when our person wins, then we just think that's it. It's on them now. Could Khadija could do it all? We don't have we don't have to do any of this other work. We don't have to support her. We don't have to stay. Or when our person loses, then we we uh, become apathetic and don't do anything. Uh, in the Muslim community, it's hard to get folks to go to committee meetings. Com uh, committee meetings are where things are decided and where work gets done. That's work. It's work and it's hard. So we have to build up that ability. It, it says in Quran, it says, those who believe, it says people get lost except those who believe, who do good, who mutually share truth with one another and who are constant, consistent and patient. And we have to follow that. That's the instruction that we have. We have to follow that and stay involved just like she's saying. Um, we are 
getting close to wrapping up, but I wanted to, uh, we have gotten some kind of nuts and bolts type questions um, for the voting process, and I'd like to direct those to Akil. Um, there's all sorts of talk about uh, election fraud or fraudulent voting. How can we trust that our votes are going to be counted? Also, um, what if we show up to vote and the line is really too long or so long, um, the rules about um, having water uh, in line and uh, some of these. And then uh, we, we did mention poll watchers um, and how wonderful it would be if there were more uh, Muslim poll watchers that would make. But what if people are intimidated by the poll watchers? So, um, Akil, if you want to take these on and then maybe uh, anyone else who wants to weigh in and then we'll have to close it, close it up. Um, so, Akil, you start. I think Doug uh, also would like to weigh in here. You're on mute. I'm I'm in terms of the water in line, I don't, it is not unlawful for you to bring water in line yourself. For you, if, if, if you think that you're going to be in line for a long time, water, snack, whatever the case may be, but what it is unlawful for someone to hand out water to those who are waiting in line. That's where the, the limitation is. So you can bring water yourself. I'm not so sure how to tell you to remedy the long lines. I think that there has been some concern because they have have closed some precincts. They have, uh, you know, you might have to travel a, a, a considerable distance in order to get to your polling place. The only thing that I can urge is, is patience. Uh, and then during the term when the elections are not on to, to approach your commissioner, to approach your councilmen to approach your elected officials about the necessity and need for additional polling places. Um, as far as intimidation in the in the um, in, in the in the voting lines. Um, and I anticipate that during this particular cycle of the election that we'll probably have some of that. Uh, my suggestion to them is to do it as if we were doing any other kind of 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 of, of uh, situation like this. Make sure you know who you're talking to, record and get their names. You do have a right to call law enforcement and ask them for some assistance if you need it. You do have a right to report this conduct to the poll managers in the precinct that you are uh, and to make some record of it and to make sure that once it's over that you report it. Intimidating voters in, in, who are attempting to vote is not lawful conduct. Uh, and uh, there should be a remedy for you to correct that. Thank you so much, Akila. Doug, you wanted to weigh in and you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Sure. So just, just a couple of things to add on all of all of what Akil said is, is spot on. Um, during the early voting period, you can vote in any location in your county. Uh, and often the first week is less uh, busy than the second week. So I would, and it also gives you more time if there's a problem. So I would definitely encourage everybody to understand where their county early voting um, uh, areas are and to make a plan and to try to vote that first week, because in Georgia, there are two weeks of early voting. Um, second, if you have a problem with your vote, you're not on the roll, or there's some sort of question about your ability to vote, uh, both Republican and Democratic political parties, uh, you can call them and they can help, as well as there are a number of nonpartisan organizations from the NAACP to the ACLU to the New Georgia Project, all of whom have um, often have hotlines. Um, during the voting periods, you can call, they can help you work through your ability to cast your vote uh, to make sure that you're gonna vote. Uh, and then the other thing that I would just say as a plug is don't keep that you voted to yourself. Tell other people that you voted. Um, it, voting is, is a little bit like uh, uh, a public health issue. The more people who vote, it's been shown. One person votes, if they talk about it, actually the, the people in their network, their friends, their family, their coworkers will also vote. And so don't keep it to yourself. A great way to help the entire process is simply to, to share that you did and, and where you voted and how it went, because uh, that'll help others do it too. Great. And Commissioner, you also have raised your hand. Uh, share with us your thoughts. Yes, I, I just wanted to, uh, all of just 
all of all of that was said beforehand uh, is true, and I agree with. However, I think the bigger issue outside of the water is the change with the provision of voting. It used to be that if you voted in an incorrect in, uh, precinct, um, unbeknownst to you, that you could do that on election day and do a provisional vote and your vote would still be counted. SB 202 does not allow that. The only thing that you can do with a provisional vote is if you get, say for whatever reason, to the incorrect precinct uh, on that day and they feel like you have time enough to make it to your precinct, they will not allow you to provision a vote and you will have to go and vote at that precinct. Now you think about someone who may be voting during lunch or someone who has to go and pick up their children. You may lose that vote because that person may say, oh my goodness, that precinct is all the way on the other side of town where I used to live. And so that will be more detrimental than the water. So I, I wanna be crystal clear Yes, the water issue is important, but the fact that you cannot provisionally vote unless you get to the precinct and it's beyond it's at the determination at that time when you get to the precinct and if it's found out that you are at the wrong precinct but you do not have time to get to the right precinct, then they will allow you to provisionally vote. Uh, secondly, I want to say that there was no fraud in Fulton County. Were there some mistakes made? Yes, but there was no fraud. And it does not matter if you holler fraud a million times, that does not make it fraud. And so we must understand the tactics that are used to more or less divide us than to bring us together. We have to advocate for the, the uh, poll workers. We have to advocate for enough polling places. We have to advocate for being able to get people registered and voting uh, in a timely fashion before each election. And so I, I would say to you that it all goes back down to advocacy of what's best to make sure every person has that right to uh, uh, be part of the political process. And I want to just uh, close here by asking uh, Imam Playman if he can just sum up what you felt was most germane, uh, uh, you know, to for this topic. Um, real, if we can keep it short because we're running out of time. Yeah, I, I can keep it short. I don't know if I can <laughs> sum it up. I really appreciate all the comments that are being made. Uh, I'm so glad that. Uh, uh, Commissioner Khadija was here with us and uh, the president of city council, Doug Shipman, Soraya, uh, thank you very much for working through the Muslim Voter Project and uh, Akil Secret, our attorney. So I will give this, which doesn't necessarily sum it up, but it's what's on my mind is that as Muslims, we must embrace shared freedom spaces. Uh, we, are, we can't long for uh, seclusion and, and isolated uh, space. We have to see uh, that our world, uh, we, we have all kinds of identities, each one of us. We are fathers, we are mothers, we are we, our, our job, but, but, but we are human beings living in this world, and we are blessed to be able to see uh, the global perspective. Uh, when I travel to lands, I always go to a mosque and go here, go there. I don't go as a tourist, I, I go as a relative of, of folks. So we are blessed to have a global perspective and the whole world is beginning to have that perspective. But what we must work for is a productive mind that will enter and affect a change of the American soul, not just for us or just for one people or one race, but for all people and for the benefit of everybody in this world. We want America to find its soul again and be a shining example for the world. And to do that, we have a role as Muslims. Well, thank you all of the panelists for talking and weighing in. I want to have a uh, uh, just a couple of things. Remember, last day to register is October 11th. The election is on November 
8th. And early voting begins October 17th, I believe. Um, if uh, you don't, aren't aware of this, um, the Atlanta Press Club has the Loudermilk Young Debate Series, October 16th, 17th, and 18th, and we will have 16 debates. Um, I co-chair those debates. Uh, we're doing all the statewide races. Please know what your choices are. We talked about uh, being familiar with who you're going to vote for, because I have friends who say, oh, I don't know who to vote for. You know, I, they, they may know the president or who's running for governor, but beyond that, they may not know all these other offices. You know, learn about them. And one way is by uh, watching uh, the Atlanta Press Club's debates. Uh, that can help you. Um, it's such a pleasure to have this conversation. Uh, thank you for letting me be part of your family, uh, Sumaya, and the whole Georgia uh, Muslim Voters Project. Now I want to turn it over to Soraya for some closing thoughts, but thank you for letting me uh, be part of this. I've really enjoyed um, listening to your perspectives. Wow. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I feel very inspired after today's conversation. And from what I've heard tonight, our future is very bright. Um, so as an organizer, I come to every event with a list of asks. So here they are. Here are some tangible ways um, to take action and, you know, participate uh, civically. So first, to re reiterate, um, the midterm elections are happening on November 8th, so don't forget to vote. October 11th is the last day to register to vote. You can register to vote or you can register your friends and family at gambp.org slash register, um, and please feel free to share this link with anyone that needs to register. Um, early voting begins, in, uh, begins on October 17th and ends on November 4th. For those of us who are working um, during the week, we can vote on Saturdays on October 22nd and October 29th. Um, and if you are having a difficult time finding your polling location or would like to look up your voter registration status, you can visit mvp.sos.ga.gov. Um, you can also create a mock ballot at gamvp.branch.vote. Um, you can put in your address and it will show you like what offices are up for election, um, who is running and what their issue priorities are. And then from there, you can kind of pick who you prefer um, and print out your mock ballot to take with you to vote. Um, if you need um, any information related to resources like transportation, legal information, or a voter hotline, you can visit gamvp.org slash vote to find additional information. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in getting involved with us, go to gamvp.org slash membership or follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook at gamvp. Um, and I'm gonna pass it to Sumaya to speak more about the ISB. Soraya, thank you so much. Um, just a couple of days ago, I saw somebody wearing a t-shirt that says, Atlanta impacts the world. And so what we're doing here shows up everywhere. So Atlanta folks, Georgia folks, let's go out there and vote. Uh, let's make a difference. Let's, let's uh, you know, there are so many challenges that were uh, mentioned to us, being involved, being poll workers, et cetera. So I encourage all of us to be more active in the process and learn and grow. Uh, you could visit us on our website or you could email me directly at director at isbatlanta.org if you have any questions or if the ISB could be of any help. Um, can't thank Maria enough uh, for being our moderator, uh, Commissioner Khadija, uh, Georgia Muslim Voter Project, Iman Pleman, Akil Secret, uh, Doug Shipman, Judy Marks, and the whole gang. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please pass the recording on to your friends and family, and we'll make that available as soon as we possibly can. Um, you all have a great evening and a great week ahead, and please be involved. Thank you. Thank you.